Okay, welcome to the August meeting of the Johnson Space Center Astronomical Society. I'm Doug Holland, the president of the JSEAS. And uh, this is our agenda for tonight. If you have questions during the uh, meeting tonight, what you can do is you can either put your questions and comments in as a YouTube comment, if you have an account that will allow you to do that, or you can email your questions and comments to jscaslive at gmail.com as shown at the bottom of the screen. And Trevor Quinn will be taking your questions and comments and asking those of our presenters. And thank you, Trevor, for taking care of that for the club and for organizing our YouTube channel. So for our agenda tonight, first we're gonna have Paul Maley with Around the World for an Eclipse plus Starlink and the Future of the Night Skies. That'll be followed by Chris Wells with a DIY Astronomy CPC 11 fork converted to a single arm mount. Then I will be doing a members mount on the M8 project and we'll wrap it up with David Havlin with Star Party News. So before we start Paul's presentation, I'd like to tell you a little bit about Paul. Paul Maley has been an amateur astronomer for the past 60 years and has been a member of JSEAS for the past 51 years. His main interests include solar eclipses, eclipses of stars by asteroids, and artificial Earth satellites, where he contributes a page on the subject each year to the Royal Astronomical Society of Canada Handbook. He founded Ring of Fire Expeditions, which is a public outreach arm of the JSEAS, to take those interested in astronomy to faraway places to observe the northern lights and eclipses of the sun. More than 2,000 people have participated in his expeditions. He has traveled to 296 countries and territories, seen 76 eclipses of the sun, which is more than any person, living or dead, and successfully observed 361 eclipses of stars by asteroids. In addition, he has completed half marathons on all seven continents and founded the Clear Lake Marathon Training Trail in 2009. His most important contribution to amateur astronomy was the discovery of the first possible satellite of an asteroid some 17 years before the first confirmed asteroid satellite was captured by a spacecraft passing near the asteroid Ida in 1994. In September of 2019, at the fifth workshop on binaries in the solar system, he received the honor of having a binary asteroid given the designation 27675 Paul Maley. And with that, I'd like to pass it over to Paul. All right, Paul, thank you for that very interesting talk. Next up, we have Chris Wells with CPC 11 fork converted to a single arm mount. Take it away, Chris. Okay, good evening. Um, my project this tonight is a DIY project. And what I'm going to do is go through the steps on a project I've just finished um, where I'm converting a CPC amount here um, done by Celestron. So this is a Celestron CPC mount. You can see it's already been deforked. So there's no OTA tube in that at all. It used to have a C11 tube. And I'm going to go through the project steps of taking a fork mount and then converting it to a single um, into a single arm mount. I'm going to talk about why did you even want to do that? Uh, whose idea was it? Uh, different project steps uh, that I went through on that project. And then I'm going to show you a couple of uh, first light and second light configurations of the project once it's complete. Okay, so first of all, why do you want to do it? Why would you want to take a perfectly good serviceable mount that has two sturdy arms and actually take one of those arms off? Well, you don't really want to do that because it's going to, <laughs> to start with, because it's going to actually um, be not as stable as a one arm mount. The reason you would do it is really so that you could actually allow different scopes to be added. You can start to put in some smaller length um, uh, refractor scopes onto uh, and use that and use the go-to capability of the mount. Also, it's an old as mount, so if you wanted your larger um, your larger OTAs to be able to do some visual work, um, old as tends to be the best kind of mount, in my opinion, anyway, for um, for visual astronomy. Um, you can get, um, um, there, there are mounts available today that are one arm mounts that allow you to put different uh, tubes on them, um, such as the Zestron 
evolution mount you can but you can actually buy it in that form today and actually put your different uh, different optical, optical tube on there whether it's a smith cassegrain grain or a small refractor this is an example of the celestron evolution mount but right next to it you can actually see a cpc mount a newer design cpc mount and the key thing here is you can see it's bigger it's that much taller and therefore you can put in a longer tube a longer refractor onto that mount and actually have an altaz mount and put your favorite refractor on there as long as it's not too long that is so that's the main reason is that you're, you're converting a what is a two arm mount to a one arm mount so that you can actually put on a variety of different scopes should you have more than one scope um it's longer arm as i said in the evolution um, you've actually got 16 inches from the base of what we call the saucer section, not saucer section as in Star Trek, but the saucer section up to the uh, up to the plate here, the saddle plate is 16 inches long from the, uh, it's an 11 inch version. So that actually allows you to have a much longer scope in, in this when the OTA swings down towards the saucer section, it's actually going to be clearing the base here. So that's, third, that's 16 inches from the base all the way up to the saddle, whereas the commercially available Celestron Evolution today is about 11 inches or so uh, up, up there. So it's a, it's, a, it's a longer length, and it allows you to put longer scopes on. The other thing that makes this a, an attractive idea of doing this is you can sometimes pick up a CPC, a Celestron CPC fork mount Pretty cheaply, a lot of what a lot of astronomers do when they've um, have actually defaulted their own C11 or their C C point um, nine point two five mount, they've defaulted those already because they wanted to put them on a German equatorial mount to do astrophotography with. So you can sometimes find these um, CPC mounts um, on cloudy nights or on on Astromark. Um, or maybe another club member has one and you can pick them up relatively cheaply as opposed to buying some something new. And this is how I came about with my CPC now. Um, while most of the world is getting curbside delivery of pizzas, I actually got a curbside delivery of a CPC now uh, to my house um, from, from a, a buddy of mine. And, uh, and he didn't want much money for it. So I said, OK, I think I'm going to do this project. Whose idea was it to do this? It certainly wasn't mine. Um, I first read about this about five years ago. If you go to Cloudy Nights, there's a whole thread on there dating back to 2014 when people started to do this as a project. And uh, so do reference Cloudy Nights, type in CPC 11 fork converted to a single arm mount, and it will put up this entire thread of a load of different people who have done this project and used it in diff different ways. Um, so really, we're talking about a larger alt-as mount, um, relatively cheap if you can pick one up from somebody you know or you buy one used, and you can actually use your different scopes on, on there within reason. You wouldn't uh, put your you wouldn't put too long a OTA tube on there or too heavy one because you're only down on one arm. But it gives you that flexibility to have an alt-as mount that is go-to in nature and gives you the flexibility to do a lot more visual observing. So key term there is versatile. And that's the reason I did this and something that I've been wanting to do now for about five years when I first read about this project. OK, so how do you do it? OK, so the first thing is this is what it looks like without the OTA on it. And I, I got the CPC without the OTA already on it. And the first thing is to take the arm off. Well, taking the arm off, it really is just two screws. It's very, very simple to do. You take the back plate off, the plastic covering plate, and you take that off. The per first problem is you find that the arm isn't empty. It has some important things in it, some important electronics in it. It has this device in here. It actually has a, a GPS unit built into that arm. And so you have to take that GPS unit that normally is about here on the arm and you have to find somewhere else to put it. And if you're a pack rat like I am, you tend to keep things in the garage and you think one day 
this little piece of plastic, which was from the corner of a washing machine, um, that's going to come in handy one day. I'm going to be able to use that. I'm going to take that from my garage and I'm going to find a use for it. So I took this piece of plastic like this, I cut it out and I remounted the GPS unit from the forearm mount back inside, inside what I'm calling the saucer section. So that part of the project went pretty well. Next part of the project was um, actually putting on a saddle plate. I already had a saddle plate, and so I really, uh, so I wanted to use what I already had where possible as opposed to spending more money on this. Um, so I only have a three inch saddle plate, and I actually managed to put a, another piece of metal behind there and mount it onto the, um, onto the existing coupler there. Here is another picture of the saucer section with the modified bracket thing. Uh, made out of plastic, which I really just double-sided sticky taped it on there, and the GPS unit is is right there. So so far so good. That part of the project went 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 pretty well. Now, where you take the arm out, you leave this big hole on the side of the saucer section. So you've got to try and find somewhere to plug it. Um, luckily, I had a um, electronics project box lying around in the garage. Another item had to keep it just in case it comes in handy one day. Well, as luck would have it, it actually fit perfectly in the hole here. And I put in some extra metal bracing here. See that metal piece there? I, uh, I drilled that out and screwed that in. So that actually gives you a handle so that this whole device here, this whole box, not only has, uh, serves the purpose of filling up a hole, it also serves the purpose of being a carry handle as well. Okay, and once I was finished, this is this is what I did. I put it, I remounted it on an existing tripod that I already had. When I got the CPC mount, um, it didn't have a tripod, so I had to use what I already had because the whole idea of the project was to do this as cheap as possible. And you can see it's here adequately carrying um, a Max Utah 180 millimeter, a Sky Max one millimeter, 180 millimeter. Um, and it's an F15 design, so it's a longer tube, and it does fit nicely in there and swings and clears the saucer section. So this was the very first um, first light configuration of my CPC mount for visual use. Um, but not being content with something being for visual use, I decided to take some pictures as well. So here's a picture of Jupiter that I took on my first light outing from here. Uh, two pictures of Jupiter, one picture of Saturn. If you're um, if you're really imaginative, you could think of that as two eyes and a smiley face. So uh, that was the first configuration. Um, now, what was the problem with this? What? Why didn't? Why wasn't I happy with this? Well, first of all, I didn't think it looked very good. It <laughs> it looks a bit. It, it looks like you've got this big mount on a spindly tripod, and it looked a bit weird to me. And it, it made me a little bit nervous about whether the tripod could handle it. Um, completely unfounded, but it didn't quite look sturdy enough. Um, and then the clincher on the decision to change from this was I already used that mount for another mount, uh, that of that tripod for another um, uh, mount that I've got, a German equatorial mount, uh, which is the CEM um, 40 millimeter from uh, 40 from I, Ioptron. So it didn't look right. I had the use for the other tripod already. I didn't. I wanted to put that uh, other mount back in uh, in circulation. So I decided to move to a phase two or a second uh, second option. So as luck would have it, another thing I had in the garage that hasn't been used for about nine years was this pedestal tripod um, from another mount that I have. Um, it wasn't really being used in any way. And it had the feature that you can either be a really tall mount or a really short mount. And what I decided to do was try and fabricate a metal bracket to attach the um, to attach the CPC saucer section to a metal bracket that then would attach to the bottom of this um, this um, rocket looking um, pier at the bottom. So this was the biggest part of the project. I already had 
as you do in your garage lying around, a piece of metal that's circular and was actually attaches directly to the CPC section. So I got lucky there. I don't know where I got it from, but I've had it for about a decade. Um, I had some metal rods. I had two metal rods and I had a light fixture, um, um, a light fixture that was the handle of something that attached to a light that you could screw into something. This happened to be the same length as two pieces of metal rod that I had. So I built this, um, this little cage here to where this clips on the top of the, um, of the pier and then would attach the CPC on the top. So that became, that was the burden part of the project. That was where you start to start to drill holes, get drills stuck in metal, start to tap holes in metal and break off taps in metal. And then you, of course you do this without swearing or getting frustrated in any, any way. Um, but you eventually fight through those issues and this is what you end up with. You end up with my second light configuration and this is what my, uh, my new CPC remounted map looks like on the short, shortened pier and on top of that bracing that I actually created. And uh, now I've got myself a nice CPC mount, an old TAS mount that I can use outside. And I also already had these little eyepiece trays and uh, that are made by astrophysics. I also have those that weren't being used as well. And uh, I think this looks a lot better than the first configuration. And that's the end of my CPC project. It took, um, took five years since I first read about somebody who did this, I thought it was a great idea, and I finally managed to do it um, thanks to the spare time afforded to me by COVID-19. Thank you so much. Hey, Chris, hold on a minute. <laughs> we got some questions for you. Um, first one, is the GPS device interconnected directly with the stepper motor in the saucer section or controlled via circuit board, assuming that this saucer, that this is in the saucer component? It was, um, it was um, really what it was is just a long wire to a circuit board, another long wire to another circuit board, which housed the, the GPS unit. This was already in the first arm. So it was a case of rerouting the wiring so that it would be in the saucer section itself. Um, so um, there wasn't really any wiring to be done. Uh, the hardest thing was really just cutting out that little bracket for somewhere for it to go so it would still um, operate. And I'm happy to report it does. You, you turn it on and within a minute it finds latitude, longitude and the time signals and it all syncs up. Um, one of the actual other advantages of it being where it is, is as soon as it finds and is linked to GPS, it has a nice little red flashing light. And it has this little red flashing light, and so the actual saucer section gives you a little nice reassuring red flashing light too. So I think it's from the GPS unit. Okay, uh, next one uh, about the, the first config that you had there. Uh, Seemed like it was a, a tad top heavy. It did make me nervous, yes. <laughs> okay. And uh, here's, a, here's a fun one. Uh, how many of your telescopes <laughs> are made out of washing um, machines? Just, just one. I've used washing machine parts, and I have used Jenga blocks. Jenga blocks are really good mounting finder scopes. All right. Let's switch back over to Doug. Hold on. All right, All Doug, right. Chris, thank good. you for that very interesting talk. And Chris seems to be coming up with uh, interesting things for us each uh, each month. That's great. Thanks for all the good inputs. All right, the next one is Members Minute, the M8 project. This one's mine. So the M8 project that M8 is the Lagoon Nebula in Sagittarius. And I have taken pictures of this object uh, several times in the past. 
And back in about 10 years ago in 2010, I was on a vacation in Colorado and I took a picture of M8 over here in the upper left with uh, M20 down here in the lower right. This was done with an 80 ED F7.5 telescope, which is 600 millimeter uh, focal length telescope with 80 millimeter aperture. This was done with a unmodified DSLR. And you can see the, uh, the dark area in here, which is the lagoon, which is what gives the lagoon nebula its name. Um, that's one of my early pictures of this one. And then later in 2017, I took another picture of it with a 200 millimeter focal length camera lens at F3.2. Uh, this is taken at the El Dorado Star Party, and this is with a modified DSLR. And you'll notice that this is actually has a deeper red to it than does the previous image. I'll back up. Uh, you can see the previous one, the red isn't quite as pronounced as the modified DSLR is. Now, one of the things I really like about this image, other than M8 and M20, is this gigantic cloud over here of dense stars and dust. Uh, when you start looking towards the middle of the Milky Way, towards the center of our galaxy, you really start seeing how dense all this is. And uh, even though I was trying to get M8 and M20, I actually kind of like this uh, section of the uh, Milky Way and, and how this turned out even more than these other objects. But that's my second or another uh, attempt at M8. So then this summer, I thought I would try to try to take M8 from our backyard, which I haven't done yet. So step one on taking pictures from our backyard is make clear the path. So there, we, when we bought our house, we thought it'd be just great to get a house that had a whole bunch of trees in the backyard, but then we got interested in astronomy. That wasn't such a great idea. And uh, M8's kind of low to the horizon. If I was going to get it, I had to cut down some trees. And just, uh, just, just kind of a, a measure of how, diff how, how much you want to take, how much you want to get the shot, is if you're willing to cut down trees to get it. Step two is the telescope configuration. I used the same ADED F7.5 600 millimeter telescope with a AT2 FF field flattener. Anytime you have a refractor, there usually has to be some kind of field lens out here to uh, take care of the field curvature. And I'm going to use narrowband filters due to light pollution in our area. I'm going to use narrowband filters to uh, image emission lines of different gases, and this will get this will uh, give me the emission lines only and cut out all the light pollution I have uh, in our neighborhood. It's done with a KEF 8300 base CCD camera. The guide scope over here is a 50 millimeter F3.2 guide scope. This is an Orion guide scope. I think it's 162 millimeter focal length and an MT9M034 base guide camera right here. These are both custom made cameras. That's why they don't really have uh, model numbers. Then the mount is a Los Mandy G11 mount. Then the other fun part of this setup is this, uh, my control system's over here in the shoe box. So inside the shoe box is a Raspberry Pi 3B plus, uh, Outbrain is an ND driver server, and then I've got a shoestring astronomy GP USB auto guiding interface. But by using this gadget out here, I can actually control this remotely from inside our air conditioned house over here and not have to sit outside in the mosquitoes and the humidity and the heat and uh, do this imaging. So, um, and this is really nice. And the other thing is, you know, this Raspberry Pi only costs $35, where my laptop costs a whole lot more than that. So it's very nice for that. And it turns out in the end that the Raspberry Pi configuration actually performs better and is faster than hooking this up directly to the laptop, which was a shock to me, but that's actually how it's turned out for me. So that's kind of a fun part of this configuration. Okay, so back to imaging. Step three, gathering the data. So like I said, I'm going to do narrow band imaging. I'm going to do sulfur, hydrogen, and oxygen. And uh, I did 16, 12 minutes sulfur, 7, 12 minutes of hydrogen, and 7, 12 minutes of oxygen. We had uh, some clear skies in, the, uh, in June from 6.11 to 6.17, a week of clear skies, which is pretty incredible for here. So I was able to do all of this. And the thing I like about narrowband images is a couple things. One thing, it's interesting to me to see what the different emission lines are actually showing. Like here in the sulfur, you see all this detail here in the outer areas. It's very interesting. The hydrogen kind of covers the whole thing. Uh, hydrogen is, is more, you know, is more pronounced than hydrogen, just like most emission nebulae are. And then oxygen is kind of in the central section here. So putting this all together, this is what the uh, final image looks like. This is a narrowband image of M8. And another thing I like about 
narrowband imaging. You can see it's a very colorful image. And you, as we saw a minute ago, the, the blue was kind of in the middle, which was the uh, oxygen. And then we had this outer area, which was the um, sulfur, which is the red part. And then the hydrogen kind of goes throughout this whole thing. But there, you, actually, you can see more details. And it's a much more interesting image to me when you actually you image the emission lines of the individual gas. Going back to my previous images, you know, it's, this is a nice image, I think, of M8, but sometimes when I'm doing imaging of uh, emission nebula, you start looking to me like just being a big blob of red. And, you know, they're beautiful and everything, but uh, I like the, the um, narrowband imaging because I can see more detail, and I think it's interesting to see where the different gases are and different elements of this object. Now, as for processing images, step four, I used PixInsight and I used Photoshop. So I did all my calibration of my dark frames, my flat lights, my flat darks, and my bias frames, all done in PixInsight. I did try to do this in Deep Sky Stacker originally, but the, the uh, performance of the PixInsight calibration was actually much better for this image. Linear processing, I, I did in PixInsight. I did dynamic background extraction, which basically evens out the background so it's not lighter or darker in the back uh, from one side of the image to the other. I did deconvolution in PixInsight. I actually like the deconvolution better that's in AIP for Win, which is kind of an older uh, ast astrophotography package. But in this particular case, I was able to get better results using deconvolution from PixInsight. Then I used MLT, which is multi-scale linear transform noise reduction. Then when I took the image over to nonlinear processing, first thing you have to do is you have to combine the sulfur and the and the hydrogen and the oxygen together to make an, uh, a color image. I used the PixInsight script SHO, which is sulfur hydrogen oxygen, sulfur hydrogen ox oxygen, AIP combined, which is a script in PixInsight. I did star reduction using a morphological transform in PixInsight. Then I brought the whole thing over to Photoshop. I did some color noise reduction and levels and curves, and that's how I uh, finished up the processing on this image. So I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way it turned out. Um, and it's a little different than my other M8 pictures that I've taken. Looking at the middle section of M8, there's some interesting objects in here. There are uh, three dark nebula, at least three dark nebula, Barnard 88, 89, and 296 down here. There's also an open cluster, NGC 6530, open cluster right in the middle. And then there's this dark channel, which is the namesake for the lagoon nebula. It's supposed to look like a, a lagoon. Somebody imagine as looking like a lagoon. And as far as I can tell, that particular dark channel doesn't have a name. I can't find a name for it, but uh, that is the dark channel that, that the lagoon nebula is named after. So that's about it. If you'd like to see my other images and other work I've done, you can look at my webpage, www.holland-observatory.net. All righty. So next up, I'd like to turn it over to David for Star Party News. All right. That was interesting, Doug. Thank you. All right. Star Party News is, uh, come on. There we go. There's been a few rays of light, but we'll see how this works. Uh, we did, there was an event July 18th at the LPI. I conversed with, um, oh, I just dropped her name. Uh, sweet little lady that we talked to there. Um, and they did it all by uh, web. So they didn't have any need for, for scopes or anybody to be there. Saturday the 29th, we do have an event at the winery. They're asking if we can possibly support it. Uh, they have uh, given me what their protocols were for their last event that they have. Uh, everybody is partitioned by group to, ta uh, to assign tables, 100 uh, person maximum, and masks are mandatory unless you're drinking or eating. So they put a few things into play. So I'll have to take this one by uh, by ear. I'd be a liar if I said I wasn't thinking about it. Um, just try to show something on a screen because uh, I know it, it will be at least a uh, first quarter moon, if not a full moon. Saturday the 26th. I don't know about this. I will talk to uh, talk to the gal and see if they need us. 
all clubs. All clubs. There's been a major change in all clubs. It turns out Louise Proctor is no longer at the LPI. I didn't realize it. She explained it to me. For four and a half years, she has been commuting between D.C. and Houston. She takes the red eye, was taking the red eye out Friday to D.C. and then bringing it back Sunday night on a red eye to uh, be the director of the LPI. But it turns out she's got a, a position there at Johns Hopkins and has two major projects. And she started there last Monday. Um, so she's got a big proposal that's due in November. So there's no way, and she, although she was willing, there is no way she can be our uh, online uh, all club speaker. So we're rolling around a few ideas. I actually thought about maybe having uh, Bob Reeves as our speaker because he not only is a lunar imager, he also is doing a lot of deep, uh, deep uh, DSO work from his uh, uh, house in uh, San Antonio. He's using a C-14 with a Hyperstar. And uh, turns out he's, he wrote a 2006 book called Introduction to Digital Astrophotography. So he's not, he's not only known for his lunar work, he's a, an accomplished DSO. So that's a possibility unless somebody's got some names. Saturday the 24th, uh, A-Day, very, very tentative. Uh, possibly not. Uh, we're talking to the, the, the new person who's in charge of the George. We don't know how that's going to go. Uh, there's a lot of ifs and things that have to be done. And then there's a event Friday on uh, November 27th. Again, until we uh, get a handle on this vaccine, whatever, we're just going to have to take these as we go. So we'll just uh, have to play it by ear. And with that, Back to you, Doug. You're good to go, Doug. All right, thank you, David, and thank you for continuing to be our Star Party Chairman, even though it may be a little easier for you these days. Okay, so our next meeting will be September 11th, and uh, the September 11th meeting will be uh, will be featuring Tom Field, who will be bringing us You Can Almost Touch the Stars, which is about astronomical spectroscopy. Tom Field is actually a contributing editor at Sky and Telescope Magazine, and he is the guy that's behind the RSpec company. So if you ever look in uh, Sky and Telescope or Astronomy Magazine, it's other where you see the RSpec uh, advertisements about how you can do astronomical spectroscopy yourself. Uh, that's Tom Field's company, and he's the, he's the guy. There's a a link to their company webpage below, www.rspec.astro.com, and we'll be looking forward to hearing what he has to tell us. So thank you all very much for attending the meeting, and hope we uh, see you next month.